and and 45 minutes uh, yes that's like that. right. oh, that's it. okay yeah so good morning everybody uh, my name is catalina montoya i am the director of the archbishop desmond tuto center for war and peace studies and i would like to welcome you to this seminar series uh, responding to disruption government, populism, the pandemic, and the breakdown of public trust organized by the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Center for War and Peace Studies, the MA in Politics and International Relations, and the European Institute at Liverpool Hope University. Now, what responses can be expected from international and national governments to reestablish trust in the efficacy of liberal and democratic politics? What lessons, if any, have been learned? In this program uh, of webinar Q and A's, we have invited experts in their field to comment on passwords towards the reestablishment of public trust in a post-COVID, post-Brexit and post-Trump environment. The Archbishop Desmond Tutu Center for War and Peace Studies is proud to bring together academics and practitioners who work on issues related to peace, war and conflict from a variety of perspectives. The center promotes the benefit of drawing on interdisciplinary approaches to shed light on the multidimensional challenges that are faced by militarism and deeply divided societies. Today's talk is entitled Sino-American Relations. Is mistrust inevitable? And our special guest is Tony McGrew, distinguished professor of global public policy in the College of Liberal Arts at Shanghai University and Deputy Director of the Center for the History of Global Development. From 2015 to 2018, he was Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Arts, Social Sciences and Commerce and Professor of Global Public Policy at La Trobe University, Melbourne, as well as Director of the La Trobe Confucius Institute. Prior to this, he was Executive Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Strathclyde University from 2010 to 2014. Educated at the University of Southampton, specializing in international relations, where he also held the position as Dean of the School of Social Sciences between 2006 and 2010. He has also held several visiting positions at universities in China, Japan, Ireland, Estonia, and Australia. Publications have concerned the subjects of globalization, global political economy, cosmopolitanism, and global governance. Current research projects include global international theory, uh, after globalization, or the questionable demise of globalization, and Chinese schools of international rela relations. So after Tony's presentation, we will open the session to a Q&A from the audience. Uh, I really want to welcome uh, Tony McGrew. It's, it's really great to have you uh, here. Um, and well, let's, let's make a start. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Catalina, for that very generous uh, introduction. I think you just put uh, a lot more pressure on me. Uh, I hope I can live up to the reputation. <laughs> but, uh, and thanks, Mike, as well, also for the invitation. Um, it, it's also a, a, a personal delight for me to um, a, at least um, virtually come to Liverpool Hope and the Centre, uh, because um, my wife, Christine, uh, was actually a student in the former Christ College, at, which was, I think part of the amalgam, one of the amalgamated colleges, which constitutes the Liverpool Hope University. So I got, I feel as though I got some kind of uh, connection to uh, Hope, and and I thought that um, your your series and this series focused on uh, disruption and trust and so on is very very pres uh, prescient and very relevant, I think, to current global politics too. And, and it's especially so because I think um, U.S. Sino relations are really one of the principal disruptors of global politics today. And questions of trust and distrust are, I think, central to that uh, relationship. And that's really the focus of my uh, talk today. So I'll, I'll talk for about 45 uh, minutes uh, and I'll try and be brief to encapsulate the, the arguments that I uh, want to make so that there's uh, enough time at the end for you to uh, have uh, questions and, uh, and actually a robust q and I welcome that. 
so let me just share the screen and share my presentation. So um, next year on uh, February 27th next year is the 50th anniversary of the Shanghai Communicate, uh, which uh, as some of you will know was the beginnings of detente and the normalization of relations between the United States and China. I think it was a profound event in global politics of the time, given the context of a still very intense, in fact, one of the intensest periods of, of the Cold War. Um, and just as, a, as an aside, it, uh, the, the communique was signed by uh, President Nixon, and it was the first visit of an American president to China. So you can get some sense of the historic nature of the occasion. Uh, and Premier Cho En Lai, and it was signed in this beautiful hotel, which is in the French Quarter, still there uh, in Shanghai, in the Great Hall. Uh, and if you ever get chance to visit Shanghai, it's actually worth going to visit. There's a big plaque there. They're very proud of the fact that this was the place where the beginnings of the normalization of relations with China commence. You might also, I, I, I put that photograph at the bottom right there deliberately because you might wonder what President Nixon, who is third right in that, is actually looking at. I think he seems very uh, suspicious, mistrustful, shall we say, uh, of Chinese food. But anyway, I thought it was a, an, an interesting photograph. But, but in that communique, uh, the communique stated that essential differences in their social systems and foreign policies, that both sides should conduct their relations on the principles of the respect for sovereignty of all states and peaceful coexistence. This was, if you like, a huge, if you like, change in not just the relationship between China and the United States, but also the beginnings, if you like, of detente more widely and a cooling to some extent of the Cold War. But since that 1972 communique in almost the last 50 years, there have actually been huge shifts. The relationship between China and the US has undergone very profound shifts too. It's gone from normalization to comprehensive engagement, very intense economic, political, technological engagement to strategic rivalry today, or as some regard it as a new Cold War. And, and it's this dramatic turn, this recent dramatic turn that I'm interested in uh, because it's, it's actually associated with really a kind of restructuring of global power relations, a disruption, if you like, to global power relations and a disruption of global politics. And distrust is a kind of key element uh, of this. And behind it, of course, is, as we all know, is this historically unprecedented, very rapid rise of China. And as some argue, by implication, the relative decline of the United States. So in this, in this talk, I want to look at three questions really and make some observations about them. It, is this reversion to uh, an adversarial relationship and mistrust, is, is it inevitable? Because there are some theorists who believe that this, that this is definitely uh, an inevitable historical, if you like, um, can or at least can be explained as inevitable and there is lots of historical evidence to reinforce that assumption. Does it preface a new Cold War? There's a lot of discussion today about new Cold War and I think um, that there are lots of issues connected to that which we need to look at. And finally to connect back to the theme of your series as could mutual trust be rebuilt uh, and would that matter anyway? given the severity now of the rivalry and the intensity of the rivalry. So uh, this is a spoiler alert, a bit like um, those you get uh, on the radio and um, the TV. Uh, and uh, I just want to summarize my argument so you can then have a sleep until we get to the conclusion, okay? So, so the, the dominant 
narratives of um, contemporary Sino-US relations, they tend to draw very heavily on realist thinking and real, real politique accounts of great power relations. And in the United States in particular, there's this kind of version of realist theory, which you may have come across, called offensive realism, associated with a character called John Mersheimer. And very crudely, th this is an argument that, particularly in relation to great powers, uh, distrust and rivalry is inevitable. Not necessarily that war is inevitable, but distrust and rivalry is inevitable. And it's particularly inevitable between rising and hegemonic powers. And, and it's an idea, or at least an account of the dynamics of great power relations, which has become hugely influential implicitly in both official thinking, uh, in, if you like, media analysis of the, the state of US-China relations, and also in academia. And, and you can see it to some extent uh, in this very popular work of Graham Allison's called Destined for War. Can America and China avoid the Thucydides trap, which is this logic, the inevitable logic of great power rivalry uh, and conflict. And in parallel in, in China, there's um, this realist thinking dominates much of the academic analysis uh, of Sino-US relations. And there's a very influential theorist called uh, Yan Zutong, who himself recognizes and references this, the inevitability of Sino-US strategic rivalry. So, so this idea about inevitability, I think, is central to a lot of the analysis of current um, US-China relations. But I want to take issue with some of the arguments in that view and some of the assumptions. And, and I want to test out, if you like, this, what I call the presumption of inevitability thesis. And then uh, there's, this arg there's this view that, and, and it's, it's becoming almost um, a very popular narrative, and it is connected to the rise of populism, uh, both across the West and in the United States. Um, that there are great similarities between the Cold War I or the original Cold War rivalry between um, the United States and the West and the East and the Soviet Union. Um, and, and I want to argue that the dynamics of contemporary US-China relations, though there are some similarities to the Cold War logic of the first Cold War, I think it's it's an idea or a label that's both misleading and actually very dangerous. It, it can generate, if you like, a propensity to be a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, about the relationship. And, and I like the comment of um, uh, a Chinese observer who very sarcastically, um, in relation to a lot of this discussion about the new Cold War said, well, you know, this comparison is about as useful as answering the question, how many Cold Wars make a new Cold War? So the, the, there's a sense in which there's a debate about this. And, and I, I want to, if you like, be quite skeptical about it. And finally, um, interestingly, uh, whilst distrust has been central, it's a kind of central notion within realist thinking about international relations, research on its opposite trust has actually not figured a lot, explicitly at least, in international relations, largely because in a lot of the discussions of international relations, trust is taken as a synonym, synonym for, for cooperation. And what, what I want to argue is that trust is much more than simply cooperation. And that um, trust isn't a panacea necessarily uh, for the state of current China-US relations, but without it, peaceful coexistence may be endangered. So that's the broad argument. And, and behind this argument, and the reason in, in, in a sense we're discussing this is, is obvious, the, the, the rise of China, that if you look at, for example, economically, um, the, the IMF argues already that at least on one measure, 
that purchasing power parity, as they call it, on one measure, China is already the largest economy in the world. If you take nominal measures of GDP, in other words, just currency measures of GDP, uh, then the United States is still the major. But China in 50 years has become the, the second, if not the largest economy in the world. And with that, and the rise of China has come, as realists argue, huge increases in defense expenditure. Uh, so China is now the second largest um, military power in the world, at least in terms of defense expenditure, and probably in, in terms of uh, person power, uh, not necessarily military capability, uh, the second largest uh, military in the world. So there's this sense that with the rise of China has become uh, threats, rivalry, and so on, and that this has begun to change the nature of and transform the nature of US-China relations. Why at this specific point in time? Well, I'll come back to that. And part of that is this, this sense that a lot of the discussions are not about today, they're about the future. And the belief that, for example, in by 2050, China won't just be the largest uh, economy in the world, it will far outstrip the United States and the European Union. And, and it's this logic of the inevitability of this and the consequences of this for world politics, uh, which is central, if you like, to the threat perceptions on, bo on both sides. So uh, let me just talk a little bit uh, about this conception of rivalry and this kind of neorealist view, just to sketch out uh, the argument. And I'll do it very briefly because you may already be quite familiar with this. Um, Catalina, uh, I forgot to put my um, stopwatch on. So can you give me a heads up as we're going? Okay, great, thanks. So as, as I've mentioned, Mersheimer. Mersheimer is, is one of the dominant theorists in, in this uh, field. Uh, and and he's, made a, he's made a lot of analysis of China-US relations, but his main concern has always been how to explain great power relations. And he wrote this book, A Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And basically um, the, the argument in it, he draws upon other, what are called neo-realist theorists in the US, particularly a, a character called Waltz. Uh, and Waltz argued that it was the anarchic nature of international relations. In other words, that, that there's no authority in international relations. There's no government, there's no central authority that precludes the creation of trust and international cooperation. And therefore the only way out of this, what uh, Waltz and others call this security dilemma for states is to seek power because only through power will that give them security advantage over their potential rivals. And in terms of great powers in that sense, competition, uh, security competition, economic and strategic rivalry is therefore a, an inevitable feature of international uh, relations. And it almost takes the same form across history. So this is a kind of trans historical argument uh, and and Mearsheimer, though, takes this a stage further from Waltz. And, and this, as this quote shows, he says, my argument is the structure of the international system, not the political characteristics of individual great powers, causes them to think and act, and this is the key word, offensively, and to seek hegemony. So for Mearsheimer, um, for great powers, the only thing that's be, that's important is it's better to be, as he puts it, Godzilla rather than Bambi. Okay, so hegemony and dominance, whether global or regional, is, if you like, central. That's the central dynamic of great power relations and the struggle, if you like, for hegemony between the great powers are always ultimately it's those relationships are always therefore ultimately adversarial, and. What he says is, uh, and, it, and it's an interesting question, he poses this question, that if you look at China's rise, why should we expect China to act differently, any differently than the US over the course of its history? The US has risen to hegemony, why should we not expect China to? And on the rise of China, he concludes that the result will be an intense security competition with considerable potential for war. In short, 
China's rise is unlikely to be peaceful. And connected to this, and it's a very important part of this, uh, if you like, neorealist and Mearsheimer's argument, is that rising powers ne like China necessarily are revisionist. They have revisionist ambitions. They seek to alter the existing world order, to alter it in ways which reflect their interests, their ideology, and so on and so on. And the hegemonic states of the time, whatever time in history, we're talking always seek to defend that status quo. So this dynamic of rivalry and competition uh, is also impregnated with this notion that, if, if you like, um, uh, rising states are always revisionist. And in this case, today, China is cast as the revisionist power and the US is the status quo power. So there's a kind of logic here within this argument, and, and it's very, um, it, it's very uh, intellectually attractive in, in a way, because it seems to explain the world we have inhabit. And also for policymakers, it gives them, if you like, a framework within which to think about how to respond to, particularly the, what is conceived in the United States, the China threat, and from the point of view in China, uh, how to deal with a declining hegemon. Uh, which can be very unpredictable, as we saw uh, in the last four years. So some reflections on this argument. I, I'm not going to go through all of these things because there isn't, isn't time. We can come back to them in, in the discussion. But uh, I think one of the problems with this argument is very determinist. It's, it assumes that some kind of logic of history and that if you go back to classical times and the rivalry between Sparta and, Sparta and Athens, for example, that same logic exists today. It's just replicated. We just live in different historical times, but the underlying historical logic is there. And, and I think that part of the problem with that is that it assumes China and the US will behave as other great powers in the past have behaved. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced of that because there's a very Western-centric thinking, I think, which is embedded uh, I think, in this narrative. And it overlooks, uh, particularly in relation to China, but also in relation to the US. These are two states which regard themselves uh, as in, as in many, many respects, unique. They're the unique bearers of particular ideologies, history, uh, and, and so on. Um, and, and so that th there's a sense in which this determinist and trans-historical argument may not actually tell us a great deal uh, and may be misleading about the current state of the, the, the relationship. I think the other um, consequence of that determinism that it overlooks the capacity of the leadership within the, super, the both superpowers to exert leadership and also to change and alter the course of the dynamics of the relationship for better or worse. And that uh, Yan Zutong, who is, uh, I think, a major Chinese theorist, he's written this book about leadership and the rise of great powers. He talks about leadership as having a profound impact on the course of great power relations, both historically and in the context of the US and China. And he points to things like, for example, what we've just talked about, uh, Nixon's detente with China. Created a, it was leadership which, which had a profound impact on the course of the Cold War. Deng Xiaoping and the opening up of China was another, if you like, example of uh, state leadership, which changed, if you like, the whole relationship between China and the United States. And of course, more recently, Trump and his America First agenda has had a very different impact on that relationship. And domestic politics and economics, rise of nationalism, populism, and so on, all those things. And China, uh, interestingly, uh, is not excused from the rise of populism. There is a sense of nationalist populism in China today, which is part of the domestic politics and, and if you like, creates a context within which Chinese, Chinese leaders operate, which has a big impact upon China's foreign policy orientation. So, and you can see that in the rise of Trumpism, populism, and the idea of containing Chinese power. And then on the other hand, the paradox of 
uh, China's economy being the factory of the war, which makes it a very powerful advocate of free trade, which does not seem to fit with uh, the logic, at least the domestic logic of state capitalism. But that's uh, another matter. And finally, this question about revisionism, uh, that this notion of Mearsheimer uh, uh, and, uh, and his associates that rising states are necessarily revisionist and uh, hegemons are necessarily status quo, I mean, just isn't borne out by the historical evidence and it's not borne out by contemporary China-US uh, relations. Just think back to the global financial crisis. Uh, China played a major role. Uh, in fact, I can remember the headline in the Financial Times in 2008, China's saving global capitalism. Th this sense that uh, China wasn't a what was not so much a revisionist power that in some areas it's revisionist, in other areas it's very much conservative and a status quo power. Uh, and look at, for example, recent, uh, if you like, the recent speeches of Xi Jinping at the Davos Forum, where he talks about a new world order, what we need to save and we need to preserve, if you like, free trade, globalization, and so on, and, and so on. And the revisionism uh, and the withdrawal, for example, of by President Trump from US engagement in a range of international institutions. So actually, this, this revisionist status quo argument is much more complex. That if you look at China and the US, they sometimes uh, agree on supporting different aspects of the liberal world order. They disagree on others uh, and they undermine together. They both disagree on certain aspects of it. So it's a much more kind of complex dynamic. Um, it's that complexity that makes the global relations complex and that there's no singular competitive logic. It's uh, that the, the relationship between China and the US is competitive, cooperative and adversarial at the same time. Uh, and that's what, in a sense, makes it difficult to analyze. It makes it even more difficult if you're a policymaker in that context of what kind of policies to initiate. So, so in that sense, I think this, this determinist logic overlooks the contingency of the dynamics of Sino-US relations and much more unpredictable as we've seen over the last four years. And as Ying concludes, US-China strategic competition is not the inevitable consequence of changes in the international power structure. And I, I tend to agree with him about that. This, however, that, that kind of logic has led to this notion that, and led to this interest in characterizing the relationship today as a new Cold War, both as an analysis of the relationship, but also as a prescription. Uh, and the new Cold War warriors, to, 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 to give them that title, uh, they, they argue that there are very deep similarities between the, uh, Cold, the first Cold War and Sino-American relations. And you can see this quote from Kaplan, future has arrived, it's nothing less than a new Cold War because the differences between the US and China are stark and fundamental and as great as the gap between American democracy and Soviet communism. So this new Cold War argument, I think borrows some of the assumptions and logic of uh, neorealism to, to make the point that if you compare the first Cold War and China-US relations today, there's ideological competition, there's strategic competition, there's geopolitical rivalry, there's embedded strategic di distrust in the sense that China perceives and believes, or at least the Chinese leadership, that the US is trying to encircle China, it's trying to contain it, it's, it's trying to change its domestic order, whilst in the United States and in the West, there's this strong belief that China is expansionist, uh, that it's trying to undermine Western institutions, uh, and so on and so on. So, so these are embedded, I think, in different concept views or world views. And associated with, uh, with this is this view that 
the world is becoming more bipolar, or at least the structure of power, and that is very similar to the division of the world in 1948 uh, and the Cold War period of bipolarity. And, and you can see the influence of this uh, Cold War narrative, new Cold War narrative on recent American policy, less so in China, because in China, there's a very strong consensus, both amongst elites and within the academic community, that the, 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 the idea of a new Cold War, uh, whilst it, it may be superficially attractive, actually uh, has very limited traction in explaining the complexity of the relationship. And so, so the problem then becomes that as China talks more about cooperation and a new world order, this is perceived often within this new Cold War, Cold War uh, narrative as threat, as expansionism and, and so on. So you can see there's a kind of spiraling logic of mistrust here. And as Zhu Tong says, US-China bipolarity will not be full-blown ideologically driven existential conflict. But for example, uh, China's rhetoric plays into, if you like, the preconceptions of threat and the preconceptions that this is in the United States, a, a new Cold War. And you can, you can see this in, you know, this is the way, this is, if you like, the worldview from China of being encircled by American military power in the region uh, and also hostile powers. And don't forget, China has the, lo the longest land borders of any country in the world. It uh, touches upon, it has borders with at least 14 states and it has tens of thousands of miles also of uh, not just borders, but sea borders. And from the US point of view is the kind of reverse image of um, China's expanding military power across the globe and across the region. And you can see these are, if you like, uh, both military bases and civil bases that China has uh, and has, in the last 10 years has created uh, across the world. And of course it excludes many of the bases it's created in the South China Sea. This new Cold War analysis is an explanation, it's a prescription, uh, but whilst there are some superficial similarities, I think there's some profound differences with the, with the uh, original Cold War. Uh, I, I, what I'll do is I'll park some of this because I'm conscious of time, but in, in general, the, the, the argument is if one of the big differences is that China and the US are in a very, in a relationship of hugely complex interdependence. That was not the case with the Soviet Union. And that's not just in the economic domain, it's in all kinds of uh, domains. So for example, US universities depend hugely on Chinese students. And, and it's a competition which is at least strategically is restricted to the Pacific. It's not just about security, it's primarily economic and so on. And the ideological element is not as full-blown or intense as it was in the Cold War, because in a way, China is state capitalist, uh, the US is liberal capitalist, but they're both capitalist in, in that sense. So there's a kind of, if you like, at least some would argue, uh, and Milanovic argues this, that there's capitalism is globalized and all we're talking about are different versions of capitalism. However, there are political differences and we'll come back to those. And, and, and critically, the world, yes, it may be the power structure is becoming bipolar, but the world isn't dividing up into two armed military camps. It's much more complex than that. So as Schweller concludes, the Sino-American bipolar system, unlike its predecessor, is not rooted in a zero-sum battle between totalist ideological tenets of Marxism, Leninism, and Western-style democratic capitalism. So how would we characterize the relationship today? Well, I think competitive coexistence is one characterization, not a Cold War, it's competition, but at the same time, the necessity to coexist. It says Zutong in China calls an uneasy peace. And it's um, a relationship which has the attributes as uh, the current 
US Secretary of State Tony Blinken said only two days ago, it's competitive, cooperative, and adversarial. So um, those are, I think, some of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced about this new Cold War characterization. But finally, to bring this back to um, the trust and the whole question about trust and distrust, which I think is central to your seminar discussions. Um, well, does trust matter? So the, there's there's the sense in which, particularly in international relations, um, trust has been ab uh, kind of absent from a lot of the theoretical uh, discussion within international relations, primarily because uh, many argue that, as Renger says, trust is precisely the virtue that's most ab ab most obviously absent from international relations. So it's tended to receive really little attention, except until fairly recently. And I want to thank uh, Catalina for making me think about trust, because it's opened up a whole new kind of area of reading that I've had to get involved with. And some of it's interesting, some of it's uh, not so interesting, I have to say. So, um, there's a burgeoning literature on, on this, and we can talk about that in, in the discussion. And a lot of that literature is also normative, that it, it, that it embodies or it articulates this normative assumption that trust does matter, uh, both intrinsically, in other words, its importance in itself, it's a virtue, uh, which or a norm which should shape interstate relations, but it's also functional. It makes, if you like, global politics work better or, or, make, or it makes, in a sense, global politics more benign. Uh, we can question that and come back to that, but that, that's embedded, I think, in a lot of this uh, literature. However, when we look at US-China relations, uh, and the only evidence that we can use for this is to look at public opinion and elite surveys, it's pretty clear that mistrust dominates that relationship. Uh, and actually, uh, it's increased over time, but it's, it's been there since 1972, this strategic mistrust. And what I mean by that is, as Chan says, attributing malevolent intentions to the other party. And this has become an increasingly dominant uh, feature. Uh, and it's a condition which you know, we've seen compounded by COVID and by the recent trade wars, which has just reinforced that sense of mistrust. I, I'm not gonna go into whether mistrust is a cause or a consequence of these deteriorating relationships. That, that I think uh, is a much more complex uh, discussion. And, and I'll just show you some of the, some of the evidence about this. You know, so Johnston, uh, who's, a, who's a, uh, an American academic who studies China, and, and he's a kind of he's got a liberal approach, if you like, uh, in many respects. He's not a neo realist. You know, points to declining trust uh, amongst the Chinese public, or or at least as he 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 calls it, attitudes of amity, of cooperation, and so on, even before recent uh, events. And that if you, the Pew Center, which does research on global attitudes, um, points to that that within China, public opinion is very optimistic about China's role. It's very supportive of China having a more global role and global uh, involvement, but it's also very suspicious of the outside world. It's suspicious of foreign intervention. And it's particularly suspicious, for example, um, that the US is trying to prevent China. In other words, the US is trying to contain China. Over half of those surveyed believe that. And, um, this survey was taken in 2016, and that's intensified uh, since then. And you can see also in that same survey that the dominant issues in public opinion are about and concern about US power and influence. But they're also curiously a mirror image of, of if you like, populism in the West and Trumpism to some extent, that Chinese public opinion is looking inwards more. Uh, it's looking inwards to resolving the domestic problems of China rather than and seeing those as really important and what, if you like, uh, the state should focus on. So there's some parallels, if you like, with what's been happening in the United States. And they're very confident, Chinese are very confident about China's role and that it will become more important. Whereas in the US, as we've seen more recently, 
um, that, if you like, confidence in America's global role uh, has been severely uh, eroded. And, and within China, um, the views of the United States, they've tended to fluctuate as this second uh, graph shows, but they've tended to become more uh, unfavorable rather than uh, favorable, okay? And likewise, uh, when you look at public opinion surveys in the United States by the Pew, you can see that, uh, again, animosity towards China, domestic public opinion is more, if you like, uh, suspicious of China. There are more unfavorable views. And more recent surveys have shown that this has increased considerably. Uh, and if you look at elite surveys, these differences are actually intensified. So all of this points to this um, on both sides, this increasing sense, intensification of mistrust and distrust. It's not just US and China that if you look more broadly amongst the OECD countries, or at least uh, the major European countries in the US, the US is not necessarily out of step with many other countries, both within the Asia Pacific region uh, and within Europe. And, and so on. So trust is a major uh, problem. So the question is, can this trust deficit be fixed? Would it matter if it uh, was fixed? And, and, and anyway, what is trust? So um, there's a very interesting book by Chan about trust and mistrust in US-China relations, which was published fair, fairly recently. And he argues that strategic trust, and he means by that calculated risk-taking or confidence or very high confidence that the other side will abide by their obligations in any agreement, that this strategic trust actually still exists in many aspects of US-China relations. Uh, and I came across a very curious example of it fairly recently where the US military and the Chinese military uh, combined and cooperated together to actually extract from Nigeria nuclear fissile materials, which were clearly potentially very dangerous if they got into the wrong hands. And that was only uh, last year, uh, 2019 and, and 2020. So there's a very instrumental, if you like, level of cooperation between China, which still exists despite all this mistrust. But it's very transactional. It's a weak notion of trust. Uh, the more substantive notions of trust are, uh, are based on shared interests or identity that when you share, a, uh, if you like, when you, you, where, where you share a common identity or you share a common religion or a common history, language and so on, that, that can tend to encourage a generalized belief of, of trust, what's called generalized trust. And it, and it creates this notion that, or, or at least, an ethic, the, 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 an ethic of trust and, and a presumption of trust, that others will abide by their obligations just simply out of duty or, or if you like, moral compulsion and so on. So it's this notion of trust as a virtue, virtue or something which is socially appropriate, that we trust others because we live in a kind of trusting environment and so on. We've got trusting values. It's what Ren uh, Renger refers to as habitual trust or a presumption of trust. And uh, it's this stronger notion of trust, if you like, which allows risk taking and, and therefore, if you like, dealing with the deep seated rivalry and problems and misconceptions in the China US relationship. It's that kind of trust which the relationship actually uh, needs. And the problem, as Chan concludes, is that Sino-American relations are far from reaching this strong form of trust. So I am going to conclude now. Can, can anything be done about it? Well, there's a very interesting uh, article by Wheeler um, about, he's got a more optimistic view that, that, that there are ways in which trust can be built into these adversarial 
re relationships. And, and I'll talk about these. We can talk about it in terms of the question. Uh, and, and his preferred view is it's about communication. It's, but it's about in, it, not just any communication. It's about institutionalized and interpersonal dialogue between the leaderships of both countries. And that this was actually uh, central at the ending days, the closing days of the first Cold War, the trust between, for example, the personal trust between Gorbachev and, um, uh, sorry, uh, between Gorbachev and Reagan, which actually led to, if you like, a spiraling down of what could have been uh, a very disastrous, if you like, ending to the uh, first Cold War. And, and that these institutionalized uh, dialogues, which were actually part of the Obama's ad, ad, uh, administration's policies, they, they had institutionalized and annual and regular dialogues between officials and the leadership of both camps can at least address problems of misperception and, and the problems of, if, if you like, the narratives which take hold, which then spiral, create spirals of mistrust. So um, this isn't a panacea, uh, and, um, and Wheeler is clear about this. There's no panacea for the, for the deep mistrust, strategic mistrust between China uh, and the US, but some sense of mutual that, that can contribute to restraint, mutual restraint, and dialing down the rhetoric and trying to, if you like, um, erode the misperceptions and misconceptions which have grown up as part of their continuous uh, interaction. But as Wheeler concludes by definition, uh, there are no risk-free futures. So uh, I'm gonna leave it there. And I'm, I'm sorry, I've gone on a bit longer than no worries. Um, would you would you mind stop sharing the screen? Yes, I will do. We yeah, can yeah, move yeah, on to yeah. the um, Q and A now. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for a, for a really great um, for a really great uh, talk. Uh, this is very thought provoking. Um, so I will now open the the um, Q and A for yep. anybody that would like to um, uh, participate. Yeah. Anybody like to uh, participate? I, I, by the way, if you, if you, if you also want to participate via chat and, and pose mm. your questions via chat, uh, that's very welcome um, yeah. as well. Um, before we uh, get some questions from our audience, uh, if you allow me, I've been very interested. I'll, 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 I'll move on with the first question if that's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, sure. There has been the, the recent, of course, UK integrated review on defense yes. and foreign and foreign policy, and of course, this moves us a little bit away from the um, from US <laughs> and China relations directly. But of course, it's, it has yep. big implications, right, for uh, that relationship for uh, UK China uh, relationship. And in that integrated review, uh, you see um, kind of three difficult areas to reconcile. <laughs> uh, there is a, a, an, an important interest to open Chinese trade and investment on one hand. Yep. On, on the other hand, a, a very um, distrustful relationship in terms of security. So looking at China's uh, military modernization and, and their growing international assertiveness and that need to kind of protect Indochina space and, um, and respond to any security threats. <laughs> uh, yep. But at the same time, uh, to defend values and using kind of soft, uh, soft power to uh, counteract uh, China's um, contending values, say. Yep. So I'm just, I'm just wondering in the, in the context, of course, of, of, of your talk, you know how counterproductive this is for uh, for mm. trust because obviously a lot of our policies also spring from you know the, the state of relationships with, with between Uni United States and China. So what yeah. do you make of of this and and, and, yeah. and where where does UK stand here? Yeah, well, I think that's a 
I know. Sorry. It's really? Uh, no, no, no. It's a very. <laughs> I, I, I think it. Uh, it's a. It's a really fascinating question because I've, I've I've looked at the integrated review and I've actually attended a number of webinars on it, uh, and and my my view of the integrated review is that that particularly in relation to China, I think as you pointed out, there are some fundamental tensions there. I don't think they're contradictions. Okay. I think there are fundamental tensions there, but in some ways what that replicates is this conception that the relationships with China are, are actually hugely complex because we want to cooperate in some areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we, in some senses, are adversaries in other areas. Uh, and that in other areas, you know, uh, we have this more shall we say, complex connection with uh, China. So it goes back to Blinken's statements, you know, which he made at the G7, just before the G7 um, foreign ministers and development meet, uh, ministers meeting in London uh, this week, that, you know, there are three, these three characteristics of the West's relationship. So I think the US has the same dilemma. Uh, so economically, um, there's all this discussion about de economic decoupling from China, but everybody realizes that as soon as that begins to impact on American consumers or Western consumers and so on, it would be hugely resisted. Not, not the least that already um, the global corporations, which if you like control those global production networks are already mobilizing to limit uh, and prevent any significant decoupling from China and the US, for example, Apple and, and so on. So I, I think these are huge dilemmas for how the West deals with China and how the US deals with China. But uh, I also believe that uh, from the other perspective, the Chinese also understand this. They have similar dilemmas in relation to how they position themselves. They, they want to be, in, in a sense, part of and a more significant actor in terms of global governance and global institutions. And you can see that in the way they've created the um, AAIB, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, the Belt and Road, and so on and so on. So, so they have a very distinct view that they want to globalize in some ways, but they understand that's threatening within a Western context. So they have to moderate their rhetoric and diplomacy and, and, and so on. So I think the Chinese all understand these dilemmas and tensions because they also equally have them. Uh, and uh, China economically, uh, un until it's, if you like, economic growth is primarily driven by domestic economics still depends hugely on an open world economic order. And in fact, Xi Jinping stated that yet again, this only a week ago. Mm -hmm. So they've got the same dilemmas. Uh, so I suppose what I'm saying is that because both sides have similar dilemmas, it opens up at least a possibility uh, well, it opens up a possibility of uh, misconceptions and misperceptions, but equally, it opens up the possibility for dialogue. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a question uh, from Hugh Neal, and thank you, Hugh, for being here with us. Uh, do you have the impression that some of the Chinese academics you talk about have taken up the discussion of trust? And how does it relate to the view in Chinese IR of the importance of relationality or face uh, of the importance of recognition of an actor's position and moral worth in a network of relationships? More broadly, yeah. um, do you find a basis in Chinese thinking on international relations for a different basis for world order that could be agreed with others, either in East Asia or more broadly? Yeah, um, that's 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 a great question. I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, and a, a really a really interesting question. So my answer may be inadequate. But um, look, I, 
I haven't, you know, I haven't studied greatly, if you like, uh, the literature uh, on Chinese conceptions of, of, of trust and how it connects to international relations. Mm -hmm. So I, I've got a kind of, I would say, limited knowledge. So within, within my limited knowledge, what I would argue is that I think there is a different conception of trust in China, uh, but I'm not I'm not sure whether or how much this is influenced by this ideological notion in China that China is an exceptional country, just like the U.S. has a notion of exceptional, that it's culturally exceptional and and i'm very wary of arguments uh, or or at least that kind of logic uh, of the asian way and, and 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 so on the asian culture is entirely different so, so uh, and kind of cultural determinism so so with those provisos from from what i've from what i've read is that that uh, and let me just reach for a book here so uh, one of the primary scholars uh, in China he, he, who's developed this, um, what he calls relational school of thinking, uh, uh, Yaqing Qin, he, he argues that trust is an essential component of global governance and trust in the context of relationships of trust is a very Confucian idea. And he goes back to Confucius and Mencius and others to argue that the notion uh, that China's approach to international relations actually is, is embedded around a notion of trust, which is trust as a virtue, not as a transaction, not as a strategic calculation, that trust is part of building relationships. Mm -hmm. And that this is a very Confucian idea and it's central to them central to Confucianism, that all relationships are built on some notions of not just identity, collective identity, but notions of trust, which are, and trust is a virtue. It's something that you're obliged, if you like, to practice rather than only practice when it's in your interests. Yeah. And that the, the, one of the difficulties is that there isn't, that there's a, um, very different views of the, the nature of trust, shall we say, in international relations uh, within some of the Chinese academic discourse compared to Western discourse, which is very much focused or largely focused on this rational transactional view of trust that you only trust somebody when you get something, you can get something out of it and when you can be confident that they won't break agreement. In other words, they will reciprocate. Whereas the Chinese view uh, assumes that morally people will behave as long as there's a relationship between them, they will automatically reciprocate. It's a relational view of the trust, uh, in, in other words. And, and that's a much stronger view of, of trust. So I think that um, I, I think that within Chinese academia and certainly in uh, Yaking. Chin's work and, and others, and even in Zhu Tong's work, who's a realist, he sees trust as, as very important, but he doesn't see it as transactional. He sees it where there are common interests. There have to be common interests and some sense of a shared identity in a kind of general sense, uh, not necessarily cultural, but in a kind of general uh, sense. A bit like, for example, the English society view of uh, world politics that there's the, uh, and uh, Wendt's view of world politics that anarchy is what you make of it right it's relational and it changes historically so it doesn't have the same outcomes so yes I think it's it, I, I think those differences are really fascinating um, how far they in China they permeate the leadership is a different question I think my suspicion, there is another character called um, Zhao Tingyang, who's a philosopher who actually uses Confucianism and, and he uses what, what, what this concept in, in Chinese philosophy called Tianxia, which, which is all under heaven, which is a kind of ancient view of China being the, the center of the world and, and so on, uh, to construct 
uh, an argument for global governance, which is actually in many respects, a very cosmopolitan view of global governance. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, I, I, I think in, in Chinese international theory, that there's a lot of very interesting work about this, but I'm not sure that it has a terribly significant impact on uh, the Chinese leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, now, uh, Alexa uh, Andrejevic asks, um, I would like to ask whether you agree with Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations and whether the new clashes of this decade shall be done at the borders of civilizations. And mm -hmm. furthermore, do you think a conflict in Taiwan with China will, could be fatal for US Western influence as the Suez War was for Britain in 1956? Thank you, he says. <laughs> So a, a conflict with China and uh, a conflict in Taiwan with China. Ah, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, so to to take the second part of the question about the you know the position of Taiwan and so on. Yes, I think that that uh, if you saw the cover of the Economist a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. you know that's the real danger point in the world today. That's the the, if you like the the the, the tinderbox of and the test of U.S. Uh, China relations, I th uh, what, and I think what's interesting about that is the way in which the U.S. only yesterday, only yesterday, uh, that the U.S. official position position is refusing to be very clear about whether the United States would actually defend. Taiwan, mm -hmm. if China decided not to took took military action to reintegrate Taiwan into China and, and so on, so there's a strategic ambiguity there, mm -hmm. um, and I I think that that is one of the critical reasons why I think that Wheeler's argument about the need for continuous uh, leadership dialogue between both. The leaderships of both states is really critical and it's something that obama created between the militaries and so on to at least diffuse misperceptions ambiguities and 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 so on but but i agree uh, and i think it and i think if i think virtually everybody agrees that if there was a conflict uh, in the south china seas which involved taiwan and the and, and the us mm -hmm. and the broader alliance uh, navies and China, it would be uh, completely disastrous. It would, uh, you know, uh, it, it would be horrendous. Mm -hmm. It would be horrendous and have huge implications. As for the hunting in Nagran, uh, look, I'll, I'll be very brief about that. I was, I've never been convinced by the clash of civilizations. Be, uh, and for one simple reason is that I, I think the, the problem is, Civilizations are often made up of different cultures to start with. It's very stereotypical. It's not dynamic. Uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't know whether to put Singapore within Asian civilization or Indian civilization, for mm -hmm. example. So it, it's kind of arbitrary. It, 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 it's a bit like this new Cold War argument. It's it seems to fit and it helps simplify the world like the Cold War simplified the world. Do you remember... Um, you, you know, um, the phrase uh, that I think it was, uh, who was it, the president, um, who, I've forgotten his name now, God, that's terrible, isn't that? But anyway, I'll come back to it, I'll come back to it. Uh, Clinton, Clinton, who said, you know, oh my God, how we all miss the Cold War, you know, the world was simple, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I think those are the questions uh, for today. I can't see any more. Oh, okay. We have yes, we have one uh, raise hand. Ah, okay. Um, uh, Ian Cook. Ian. Hello. 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 Can you, can you see me? Oh, can you hear uh, me? No, not very no, well. No, I can't. Um, it's a little it's good. Yeah. Yes, it's um. It, you know, I am a geographer, so. One of my concerns is that complex relations emerge around the peripheries. I think for China, the Taiwan 
Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang, are all definitely part of China. Whereas for outside powers, they may see the such you know, possibility to sow discord and distrust mm. around those areas. Mm. Have you any comments on that dimension? Well, uh, I certainly uh, agree that that China conceives of itself as Greater China and sees you know Taiwan as part of China, Hong Kong, and and, and so on, um, and that that is the red line for China. I mean, if you if you look at all of the rhetoric, if you look at the official discussions, you look at China's 2015 national defense strategy. It's very very uh, clear how it conceives of Greater China, if you want to call it that. Uh, and, and I think this is one of the uh, the other kind of critical issue in U.S. China relations is there's still this conception, I think, in 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 the U.S. that as you call it, these peripheral areas mm -hmm. somehow have longings to be part of the West or, or whatever, and that they should be supported. And I think that creates antagonism in China. It, it, it stimulates that whole kind of view of the world about the century of shame and so on. Uh, and, and I think it's, a, again, it's a bit, it, it, it contributes to the tinderbox, I think. Uh, is that Ian Cook, who I used to know as Ian Cook? Hello? Ian? Yes, hello, Tony. Nice to ah, see you. It is. Okay, great. Well, it's just <laughs> nice to meet you, if only virtually and yeah. um, in, invisibly. I don't know if you can see me or not. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, it's complicated because uh, it's, it, you know, there are, if you think of Hong Kong, uh, that's uh, again a, a major issue, <laughs> I think, for, for for China because it's considered domestic. It's a domestic issue. Mm -hmm. Now we've got another question. All right. Uh, by Yong Yang Wan. Hi, uh, Yang. Do you think the different cultures in the United States and the West in general? and that of China are affecting the understanding and trust between the US and West and US West and China. Um, do you mean, uh, I, I suppose there, there, there are two levels of that. I think that um, culture, um, well, cultures, quite a broad concept isn't it <laughs> in, in that sense i think i think interestingly um the strategic cultures if you if you look at the military on both sides there's some very clear commonalities between the strategic cultures uh on both sides which by definition because they're based on mistrust and they're about defending their uh, states and, 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 and so on, and defending China or defending the United States, obviously breed uh, mistrust. Uh, and in, in, in the US, there's that sense that this is about containment and in China, it's about encirclement. So in that sense, str strategic cultures can influence levels of trust in the relationship quite significantly. Um, in terms of broader popular cultures. I mean, there are lots of commonalities between uh, the two cultures. Um, you know, those of you who've been to China will see it's a very commercialized and a very consumerized um, society. So at one level, there are some commonalities, but, uh, uh, but at deeper levels where trust is about identity and Chinese identity or American identity, then I think you can begin to see, you know, the creation of that identity as a source of, if you like, conflict and distrust, which I think is very powerful and is very powerfully, I think, illuminated in those statistics from the uh, Pew organization, the Pew Research on Public Attitudes, both in China uh, and the US. And, and to some extent, you know, you can argue, well, you know, the problem, as, as some some argue, the problem in China is you know you can't you can't actually 
assess public attitudes because people are just told what to believe, which is not uh, isn't isn't correct. The problem is how you do public surveys and, and, and so on. So there's an element, I think, of uh, truth or validity about public opinion surveys in, in China. And they are, interestingly, in more recent times, there has been, I think, a rise of more populist sentiment, which is about a more kind of aggressive stance of China to, which reflects a more aggressive stance of China to the outside world. And it reflects, to some extent, many of the same factors of which have driven populism uh, in the West, except the interesting phenomenon is it's largely middle class. So I read a, a recent study about, for example, uh, right-wing populism uh, on the web in China. Uh, and this was a very systematic study which, which demonstrated that actually there's huge middle class antagonism towards the United States in particular and mistrust and distrust and the desire for a more assertive Chinese uh, foreign policy towards the United States. And, and, and of course, as you know, uh, in China, the growth of the middle class and maintaining the growth of the middle class, like in many countries, is not just central to the development strategy, it's central to the political strategy of the Communist Party and the regime. That's in a sense where it partly gets much of its legitimacy from. So that's a kind of worrying tendency, which, which is a kind of mirror image of the populism, which we saw with the rise of Trump and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Tony, thank you so much for answering these questions. I think we don't have any more questions okay. in or Q&A or, or raise hands. So I think we're gonna leave the Q&A like that. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I, wa I wanna thank you all our attendees. And, and Tony, thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome, it's uh, very interesting. Thank you for great questions uh, and everybody stay safe and good luck with your studies.